Painting and drawing can be super fun, but it could also be very frustrating and very daunting as a beginner. I want to give you all my best tips from experience that really work and that sometimes can be life-changing. Let's get to it. The first one is kind of like a general statement, but also a state of mind. And it's to give your art some importance in your life, as much importance as you want it to be. Tell people that you're doing it, talk about it, let it be known. I feel like if you prioritize it, it'll make a big difference in how often you draw and paint, how often you think about it and how much sp physical space and mind space it takes in your life and it can make a huge difference in your daily practice. It sounds like a general obvious statement but it's really not which brings me to the second tip which is huge. Probably the biggest most important tip is to make space, physical space, like a studio space for art. I know a lot of you don't have space. I understand that. My first studio was half of my bedroom that I converted into an art studio. It was really a small space. I put a table in my bedroom, a little bit of a corner of a wall and a couple of drawers. And that was my studio. Creating a studio space, whether it be just a table, a corner of a room, a wall, no matter how big or small, is going to make the biggest difference in your practice. Trust me on that. And one thing that goes hand in hand with creating a studio space, big or small, is to leave your art supplies out. Out and ready to go at all times. Don't think of cupboards, putting things neatly inside, orderly, and having it closed and super nice looking. Don't think about that. It has to be out and ready to go. Pencils out, paintbrushes out, sketchbook open on your table. By seeing it constantly in your daily life, just passing by, it's going to kind of like call you to it, whether you want it or not. It's gonna be a lot more inspiring to go sit down for a few minutes and try a few things. When I'm on the couch watching a movie and I think of painting, I very often don't feel like getting up and going to do it because even though it's super fun, it takes energy and it's work sometimes. And knowing that I have a dedicated space, but not only a dedicated space, having my stuff out and ready usually makes the difference between me doing it and me not doing it. That combined with another tip that's coming up, you'll see. I couldn't tell you how many times I would have stayed on that couch if I had to sort through cupboards to kind of get my stuff out and set up before even starting. The setting up sometimes is what blocks us to even start. Trust me on that, no matter how much space you have, create yourself a tiny little nook that will be inviting to you and leave your stuff out. When it comes to art supplies, I would say that spending your money on paper is the best investment. Depending on what you use, like if you use watercolors, I know that the pigment in watercolor can be finicky and fade a lot depending on the quality of your paint but in most cases stuff like acrylic paint won't really fade much with time there's a few exceptions but usually it kind of stays good enough but paper can deteriorate a lot good quality paper acid free paper thick nice paper is always a great choice and that's where i would advise to spend money a lot more on paper than brushes and art supplies and pigments and things like that i never skimp on paper i never put any amount of effort if i know that it's regular printer paper that will get messed up after five years think about it your time is super precious if you spend an hour or two hours on a piece, it's got to be done on good paper so that if by any chance it comes out beautifully, you have it forever. And as a beginner, it's so tempting to buy a whole bunch of art supplies because it feels so inspiring to have new toys and to want to try everything, all the colors, all the brushes, everything. But I would advise to start small and really learn to focus on creating the action of doing things rather than wanting more stuff because it's so easy to get caught up in that i'm guilty of it sometimes i get so excited when i see new pastels or new art supplies 
I want everything. But the reality is that having a lot of stuff at some point becomes overwhelming. There's too many possibilities. It becomes too big and it's counterproductive. Instead of being inspiring, it's kind of paralyzing. But by starting small and having a minimal setup of things that I really love, it brings the focus back to the creative process because that's where the true uh, reward and meaning is and where the fun should be in the action of creating making progress learning exploring that's where all the focus should be and that's where the true inspiration should be as well not really art supplies and getting more stuff but obviously it's all a question of balance balance between rewarding yourself with a new piece of art supply and really using up what you have and focusing on creating because sometimes a new pen or a new set of pastel could spark your imagination and make you paint or draw five pieces in a row just because you got that new thing. So it's really a question of balance. But focusing on the creative process is never gonna let you down, promise. Another thing not to get too caught up into would be all the technical stuff like what's the best quality paint that will last 500 years or what's the ultimate brush to use for this specific technique to paint a tree all that technical stuff will come with time and i feel like it could be paralyzing or even sometimes a good excuse to say i can't do it until i can afford this specific thing you know what i mean Whatever you feel like doing, you can do with the most basic things, even like kids' art supplies. I have challenges on this channel where I painted a portrait with crayons. I mean, you could do beautiful things with pretty much anything. So there's no need to try to optimize everything. Just go slowly and work on one little thing at a time. All the technical stuff, you'll learn it as you go. Which brings me to fun. Follow the fun. That's so important to me. That's something that I want to do, that I preach, that I feel like everybody should do. Instead of chasing all the technical techniques, which you need, obviously you do need in order to learn. But let's say you're trying to learn the piano. You don't need to know all the music theory or all the scales before starting to play the piano. You can learn a song that you really love without knowing any technical anything and just having the reward of being able to play the song will make you want to slowly dig into some parts of technical knowledge that would be useful for you at certain times. Same for art. If you follow the fun, you'll want to do a lot of it. And by doing a lot of it, you'll improve super fast. Following what I'm naturally drawn to and what seems exciting and fun and reachable, like a low hanging fruit, it will bring me to want to learn the things that are a little bit harder, more technical, where I have to read and practice a lot, just because I'll have that instant reward of playing with color. Sometimes you need fun to get to the harder parts. Human beings, you know? One thing that I try to focus on a lot is to quiet the critical inner voice. You probably have one. If you don't have one, I envy you. I have one that's always in the back criticizing what I'm doing, how it's not great, it could be better or whatever it feels like saying on that day. I try to quiet it as much as possible, try to enjoy the process and focus on appreciating the good bits of my painting or drawing and not dwell on the bad bits. Most often than not, that judgment voice is really unnecessary and it's very detrimental to the process of learning because everybody can paint, everybody can draw, everybody. It's just a skill that you practice over and over and over again because you like it. And at some point, oh my God, you painted a super realistic portrait that you never thought you could paint just because 
you did it slowly by slowly and you learned new little bits of skills and knowledge and at some point it kind of comes together and you can do it. It seems magical, but it's not magical. Anyone that can paint or draw knows the secret, time and passion. Passion as in liking it enough to do it a lot. That's all it takes. In the same vein as quieting the inner critic, I feel like focusing on my natural way to paint and draw and embracing my flaws, kind of accepting that my natural way of a drawing a line could be super jagged or like uneven or whatever and finding the beauty in my flaws could be very liberating and very helpful as well. Helpful because your natural way of being is completely unique and personally that's where I find beauty, not in something that's aesthetically perfect, but more in how unique something is. Like a Van Gogh, you've never seen anyone paint like Van Gogh, right? So I bet no one else in the world will ever paint like you. And that's something to celebrate, to not dismiss and to kind of embrace. There's a lot of stuff that I do that to me are flaws in my own opinion, but I try to kind of embrace it. And if I really want to change it, I can practice and kind of go in a different direction with time. But as it is now, I'm just trying to embrace everything, the good bits and the bad bits, just go with it. And everyone is so different that some people will adore a painting that you created that you absolutely hate and vice versa. Something you'll be super proud of, you'll find it very unique and different. Some people will really dislike it. So it's good news. There's something for everyone and that concept of not judging yourself harshly, especially in the beginning, it has a lot of value. The least critical you are about your art at the beginning, the faster your progress will be. Don't judge yourself and do a lot of work. You'll become magnificent. I promise. Another way to learn faster is to be super bold and not be afraid to make mistakes and make as many mistakes as you can. Because if you're being super cautious and hesitating in your way of painting and drawing for fear of making a mistake, it'll take a lot longer to learn. When you make a really big move that you really dislike, it's obvious what you've done and why you dislike it. So it's easier to create a memory of, oh, to me, this is a mistake not to be repeated. But if everything is kind of like subtle and not very bold, it's gonna be harder to distinguish between mistakes and good bits of a painting. So be bold, try hard, don't hesitate. You will learn a lot faster that way. I feel like I'm throwing so much information at you. I could divide this video in two separate videos. But I just want to give you all my best tips so you can rewatch it a bunch of times and take notes if you have to. I'm gonna keep going. We're almost there. Not quite almost there, that's not true. We're gonna get there. There's good tips coming up, trust me. Now, in a very practical day-to-day -day thing, I feel like one thing that is super useful is to not throw away bad art. Keep everything you make if you can just because it's so much fun. It's so rewarding to see where you came from and your progress months, weeks or years later. It's so rewarding and if you throw away all your bad art you won't remember how different and how much progress you've made. Trust me you won't remember and also sometimes let's say I'll paint something that I, in the end, I feel like didn't work. And by keeping the painting, I realized a few weeks later that some bits of it are actually very interesting, but I couldn't really see it because I couldn't get past the bits that I didn't like. And those interesting bits can spark new ideas in future paintings. So it's really, really a good practice to keep everything. I kept at least 90% of everything that I created. I haven't regretted it. Another way to track progress is to take works in progress photos. 
So as you start your painting or your sketch, take a photo, work for half an hour, an hour, take another photo and having this progress of a painting, it's a really great thing to document. It could be practical for so many reasons, obviously seeing your progress, but also a few weeks or months down the line, if you want to create a companion piece or something similar, you kind of have the steps of how you went about it. And in the same vein, sometimes it happens to me a lot. I have a tendency to overwork my painting as in I should have stopped at a sweet point in the painting process, but I went beyond and I kept working and working at it, making it a lot worse than it was at, at that point. But by taking a bunch of photos, it's a really great way to learn when the sweet spot is and when to recognize when a painting is beautiful and finished as opposed to trying too hard and kind of messing things up at the end. It happens to me a lot. <laughs> A note on sketchbooks. There's many ways to see sketchbooks. Some people create beautiful artworks in their sketchbook and they see it more like a collection of their best work and um, an album of their best work, but that's not how I see a sketchbook. To me, a sketchbook is a tool and it's a messy tool. It's where I put all my ideas and it doesn't look good and it's all messed up. Sometimes there's pages that are ripped and it's not meant to be pretty for me. It's really a tool that I use to jolt down ideas and kind of like work out how I'm gonna create a, a final work. I feel like beautiful sketchbooks can be paralyzing sometimes, especially if you did like five or six pieces that you really like to sit down, set up and start a new piece, you're afraid to mess up. Sometimes it can even prevent you from drawing or painting just because it's too intimidating. I prefer keeping my work separate from my sketchbook, like my drawing or my painting on a separate page where my sketchbook is a big mess and I can do whatever in it. I never try to make it beautiful. If anything, I try to mess it up as much as possible so that I won't feel that pressure to perform when I use my sketchbook. It's working for me. It's not for everyone, but it's working for me. When it comes to format of paintings or drawings, in university we were very encouraged to work large. It always felt like if you worked in large formats, you were more legit than working small, which I find is a mistake, but maybe that wasn't the intent. Maybe. The intent was to be a little freer and loose in the approach of the artwork. I just don't know. I just remember teachers saying work large. So I had that instinct of always buying large canvases and painting large, which is not great because I don't have all this room to store all these paintings. It's just not practical. And I've learned that by painting small, I find that I can work a lot faster, learn faster, explore a lot more, just do a lot more work because it feels less daunting. And if I have a super nice painting or drawing out of it, it's not wasted. I always use super quality paper and I could frame it. The storage becomes a lot less of an issue because stacking paper is not as hard. Working in smaller format is really amazing as well to be able to scan your work and sell prints down the line. Whereas when you have a super large canvas, you have to take photos and you need a super expensive camera for high res quality. So working on paper instead of on canvas is a great, great option. Working small for studies until you find your style and that you have, you're very prolific or very comfortable with what you love to paint. You want to do a lot of it. I feel like there's no need for large canvases. Just a question of personal opinion. Budget is an issue as well. Canvases are so expensive. So if I had to wait to be able to buy 10 canvases before starting to paint 10 paintings, I would not progress as fast but I can buy a pad of paper and have 10 paintings in a smaller size super fast. Working small, working on paper makes you progress faster. 
it's a theory, but I feel like I'm right. Another thing that is super important is to store your artwork the right way and be very cautious and use portfolios and place them neatly in a secure place where it won't get wrinkled or messed up. Putting a date and a title. Titles are less important, I feel, but the date and your signature on every single piece as you're doing it is super important and storing it in a dry safe place is so important i feel like having spent hours and hours on a piece of art to have it scratched or torn it makes no sense and i would rather invest in a portfolio and paper than buying a bunch of canvases and have nowhere to store them properly. Because canvases, when they're not hung on a wall, they tend to warp. It's so hard to store them properly. Portfolios are plastic containers laid flat. Your art is worth it. The next two tips are about inspiration. I feel like just sitting down and painting is way more important than being super inspired by a specific idea. So I like to collect images to potentially paint. I have different folders in my phone, like landscapes, portraits, and different things that I'm naturally drawn to whenever I see an image that I'm interested in or I take a lot of photos of things that I see in my life and I file them in my phone under those different albums so that when I start painting, I don't have to think about what I should be painting or what I would be inspired to paint. I have a bunch of backlog of potential things to work on and practice. Every single piece doesn't have to be like a, a grand idea sometimes just painting a fox is way enough to learn new things and explore new materials new ways of doing things mixing different colors together so many things so it's better to paint whatever even if it's a little bit uninspired and focus on getting better at your skills than waiting for inspiration because waiting for inspiration it's a big gamble. Sometimes you'll be very inspired by something, start painting and it really won't come together. And other times you won't be inspired at all. Sit down, just ply through and it'll give something amazing. It's kind of unpredictable, especially at the beginning stages. So just doing it no matter what and having the least amount of Doubt or questions of searching is ideal. So collecting reference photos is kind of like having your art supplies out and having your studio space. It's one less decision that you have to make in the creative process. You can just sit down and start painting. Before I was talking about following the fun, making it fun, I also think that having an attainable goal is really key. I don't really get excited by the idea of learning perspective. That seems kind of dry to me. But if I think, oh, I'm going to paint my grandma's house because it holds such um, important memories of my childhood, by working on a specific project that is meaningful to you, you will naturally want to learn all the technical bits that you need to learn in order to get it done. But also choosing a project that is attainable, like not beyond your reach, like you know yourself. If you get discouraged by something when it's too complicated, then take something that is the most achievable, that will bring you the most joy. And having that project completed is really important because by building successes, it's a lot easier to go and tackle a project that is bigger a little bit down the line. Like working on 10 very easy small projects and actually completing them, you build up a lot more confidence than working on something that is very, very complicated for months at a time and kind of having it only 75% done, you won't get as much drive to keep going and learning. Let's say you're painting something, you're not too happy with it, it's not going in a direction that you wanted it to, you're getting frustrated. 
make a pact with yourself that no matter what, you're just going to finish it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to spend a lot of time finishing it, but just finish it so that you can call it done no matter what. I feel there's always going to be something a lot more rewarding when you're done with a piece, when you reached your goal and you finalize the project. Whether it's successful or not, you can at least feel like you've done it. And a lot of the times you look back on it months later and it's going to be a lot less bad than what you thought it was. And sometimes you'll even be surprised and look at it and think, oh my God, I thought this was bad, but I love it. It's actually really good. It's really hard to judge a piece of art as you're doing it or especially like as you're done with it. I can never tell if I love it or not. I have to let it simmer, let it gel. And usually a few weeks later is when I know if I love it or hate it, because whatever really pops out of the piece at me is going to be either something that I really dislike and it'll be clear or it'll be something that I love. So giving yourself time to let it simmer, not judging it right away and most of all, finishing it no matter what. Procrastination. Is it an issue for you? It's a big issue for me. Having grand ideas of a painting series and seeing it in your mind perfect and completed sometimes feels almost as good as doing it. Am I crazy? I don't think I'm crazy. So when I know that I want to start a painting but it feels unattainable, I do the five minute rule. I make a pact with myself that I have to get up off the couch, go in my studio and start five minutes. I only do five minutes, that's my job. If after five minutes, I'm not into it, it's not working out, I wanna stop, I don't beat myself up. I did the five minutes, that was the deal, five minutes. But, most often, I'm telling you most often, like 95% of the times, it's all about inertia. As soon as I'm sitting down, I'm starting to paint or draw. I'm like, oh, whatever, it's not that bad. And I keep going for two hours. 95% of the time, I will just work and work just because I let myself do it for five minutes. 5% of the times, I will not feel it and after five minutes i'll be like i feel super tired i have a headache this is frustrating i'm not into it and i will just not do it and i won't feel guilty at all that's the key not feeling guilty because you you did what you said you would do the deal was five minutes you did five minutes it is a success doing two hours is a bonus but that wasn't the deal the deal was five minutes Another way to beat procrastination, and I do that all the time, is to break down the task into micro tasks. I get overwhelmed so easily, so easily, I can't even tell you. So if I have a painting to create, let's say a landscape, I'll break down my painting into the smallest step that I could think of. So I'll make a list, choose my paper, mix the colors, choose my brush, all those are different steps. Sometimes there's 20 steps and I don't give myself the goal to finish everything in one go. But within that five minutes that I was talking about before, I pick one of the steps and I'm like, I'm just gonna complete this step in five minutes or so. And I'll have done one thing on the list. And it works, it works so well because before you know it, you've done eight steps on your list without even thinking about it. You can cross it off after your session of an hour or whatever, and you're more than halfway there. The five minute rules and breaking things down in micro little bites is a life changer. Try it. Try it if you have a tendency to procrastinate. That's a big problem for me and it really, really works. Earlier I was talking about inspiration. Sometimes we don't know what to paint. It happens to all of us. And not overthinking it and just drawing or painting is really important because it gets us to progress and just work. And the more we do, the better we get. That's completely true. But overall, in general, I feel like it's always a great idea to paint things that are meaningful to us. 
instead of choosing a royalty free reference photo on the internet, digging into old photos of childhood memories or whatever is always going to have a lot more impact. It's always going to be more rewarding to us just because the work will have an emotional connection to us. And years down the line, it's not going to feel outdated. It's always going to feel alive and important as an art piece, whether it be your cat or someone you love or a place you used to go. There's going to be that meaning that anchors you to the piece. If you're interested in portraits, paint people from your family, your friends, your loved ones. If you love landscapes, paint places that you've been to gone on vacation or places that are meaningful to you, it'll really pay off. As a beginner, I used to get very discouraged through the whole process of painting and drawing. I felt frustrated and I focused a lot on the end result rather than the creative process. I know better now, but one thing that I would advise is that remembering that the first stages, even pretty far into the painting process, things are going to look super messy. It's going to feel very messy, like it's not coming together at all. And I feel like it's when the painting is maybe 70% done that it all kind of starts to come together. So don't be alarmed at the beginning of a drawing or a sketch. It's supposed to be messed up. It's supposed to not look right. You're going to build it up and at the end, it's going to look good enough. I promise you. Another great way to progress is to find a mentor. It could be someone that is in your real life. That would be amazing if it's someone that you can interact with and someone that can give you advice and guide you. But even if you don't really interact with that person, it could be someone online on Instagram or whatever that you're very inspired by and you feel like whatever they're doing it seems approachable enough that you could get there at some point being inspired by people that you feel their work is unreachable and it when it makes you feel bad about your own work or about yourself i feel like that's detrimental it's better not to watch those people or their work if it's going to make you feel bad but having someone as an inspiration and having some pieces of work that are very aspirational and attainable for you is a great way to progress whatever you do don't compare yourself to others there's always going to be people that are a lot better than you there are so many people better than me better at making videos better at painting better at so many things I don't even try to be better at anything. I'm just trying to be the best me that I can and enjoy myself as I'm doing it. That's the only thing. Don't compare yourself. Nothing good can come out of it, really. You're unique and that's, that's your gift. The fact that you're unique. Celebrate that. If there's one thing to remember and take away from all this, I feel like talent is misunderstood to say the least i don't want to say talent is a myth i don't want to start a big debate but anyone that does something really well knows that it just takes a really long time and doing it a lot a lot and a lot and having a lot of love for it for you to want to do it a lot a lot a lot and a lot that's where the magic is. It seems magical, it's not magical. You'll do it for a bunch of years and at some point people will say how talented you are. What people call talent is the mixture of love and work. I guess that's what talent is. So if you feel that you're not talented or that you, you won't get there, it's not true you will get there. All you have to do is keep going just one little step at a time. And that's why I'm saying find the fun because if it's frustrating or too hard, you're gonna quit. If you make it fun all the way through, you'll get there, you'll be amazing, you'll be super happy, fulfilled, and you'll want to do it more and more and more. That's the key, finding the fun. Be kind to yourself. If you want more inspiration, you can go watch this one subscribe if you haven't subscribed i'll see you in just a few days for another one
Thanks for watching. Bye.